All right, everybody. And as always, it's good to see you. Welcome to the first of hopefully many what we call lunchtime learning blasts. Uh, my name is Pete and I am the training manager, one of the trainers here at the personnel board of Jefferson County. And we're doing these lunchtime learning blasts just as a way to share some information that maybe you wouldn't get in a training class. We use uh, news articles, we use things that are happening uh, in society right now and just kind of share this if you're maybe you're having a sandwich um, at lunch maybe you're at your desk maybe you're in your car but we're going to take 15 20 minutes just share some information with you as I mentioned earlier you can comment along in the comment box on Facebook live um, as well so today's topic is bad boss behaviors to avoid and this is based off of a uh, recent study that was done by a group called Bamboo HR, and they do a lot of uh, HR um, uh, measuring and functionality throughout the year. And they decided to go ahead and, and share what they thought last year's the worst behaviors of the worst bosses were last year. So there's 10 of them. And I'm like, we don't have time to go over all 10. But I thought I'd share just a few of them with you. So if you are a supervisor, this is very clear, don't do these things. <laughs> it's very, very cut and dry. And if you're not yet a supervisor, this is great information, again, that you can use when you get promoted, when you get to the next organization, when you move on. So hang on one second, and we will get started. All right, so here we go. Number one, bad bosses take credit for their employees' work. Bad bosses take credit for their employees' work. Listen, don't do this. <laughs> I don't even know what else to add to this one. Don't do this. You know, um, especially in local government, there's certain levels that are very ego-driven. Um, it's about making sure that that, that, that I let my director or my mayor or my supervisor know that I'm valuable. And the way to, to, to get valuable and not have me be replaced is to make sure that, that everybody knows that I did this work. Well, the worst thing you can do, again, one of the worst traits you can do as a leader is to ask your team to get involved with something or ask a coworker to help you with a project. And then when someone says, I wanna thank Pete who you know, worked on this, and I, and I just nod and go, thank you. I did good. When in reality, what I should have said was, it was a team effort. I want to thank Michael and Kim because they're the ones who actually got this project up off of the ground. So, you know, taking credit for your employees' work. Um, if you're good at what you do, you don't have to worry about someone coming along behind you and taking your job and you're hoarding all the information and taking credit for everything. If you're good at what you do, you don't have to worry about that. So, again, very simply, there. There's enough credit to go around for everybody, and especially if your employees have an idea and you take that idea as your own, if your employees bring a project forward and then you present it to somebody else and don't give them credit, that's going to be frustrating. So again, don't let anyone tell you this is okay. Don't take credit for other people's uh, work. Greg just joined us from Hueytown. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for jumping in. Again, make sure that you like this on Facebook. If you're watching it live, if you're watching it recorded, don't worry about that. And leave us some comments as you go, like and share uh, as we go along. Um, let me ask you this question. Who is more likely to quit because their boss takes credit for their work? Men or women? So go ahead in the, in the comment box there um, as you're watching on Facebook live. Go ahead and throw in your thoughts. So you, Who's going to quit? I'm sorry, who is more likely to quit because their boss takes credit for their work? Do you think that that's something that men have a higher percentage of doing? Or do you think that's something that women have a higher percentage of doing? And again, the numbers are, you know, fairly close. But um, as you're putting your guests there into the into the comment box, um, I'll let you know, here's the answer. Um, it's women. 21% uh, of women had said they're more likely to quit because their boss takes credit for their work, whereas only 12% of men. So that's something, again, well, well done. Well done, Josephine. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, and again, not to get too gender specific or anything on that, but what this means is, again, if you are a male supervisor and you have women who you are leading or managing and you start taking credit for their work, there's a higher possibility that the women are going to say, I'm sick of you doing this. You do it all the time. I'm out of here. Um, whereas men will probably just go, I hate you. 
and just keep working, <laughs> just keep working there. So um, again, just kind of be aware of that. Number two, if you're a bad boss, don't do this, y'all. Hey, Kelvin, thanks for joining us, buddy. Kelvin's joining us as well. Good to see some some familiar faces on here. Um, bad bosses don't trust or empower their employees. Again, we talk all the time in our training department. We say, if we could get trust and respect uh, across the board, across all agencies in the merit system, we'd be out of a job because there'd be no need for training and development. There'd be no need for coaching. There'd be no need for remedial training because everybody trusts everybody. Everybody respects everybody. Everybody empowers everybody. So this one to me rings true a lot in local government. And I'll kind of tie it back to the first one, the whole trust factor, you know, you know, we, we talk a lot about trust. I, I believe that there's two camps of trust. And I think I've said this in previous training classes. One camp is I'm going to trust you until you burn me. I trust everybody. I tr when I first meet you at face value, I trust you and I get burned along the way. The second camp is you've been burned so much that you say, I'm not going to trust anybody till I get to know them, till they can prove themselves to me. And that may take three months, six months, nine months down the road. The problem with that is if you're a supervisor and you look at all your employees and say, you have to earn my trust, it'll be six or nine months before I learn to trust you. Well, that's going to be a struggle for them because they're coming in, they're doing stuff. You know, you're basing the trust level with them on other experiences you've had with individuals and every individual is different. So again, trusting and empowering your employees to kind of do the right thing. Um, you want to make sure you do that. Bad bosses don't trust or empower. All right, let's talk about this. This is very COVID specific. This is happening to a lot of us uh, right now. Bad bosses don't care if their employees are overworked. They don't care. You know, sorry, you got to work the weekend. Sorry, you got to work long hours. Sorry, there's all kinds of things going on. And, and sometimes we take this, I got to be careful how I say this, but um, when you're talking about being overworked, there is a time and place where a lot of us have to be overworked. And for a lot of people, it's right now. Okay. My, my, my wife works in the healthcare industry, people who are first responders, people who are working, you know, front lines. Uh, if we can't get backfills, the jobs still have to be done. We have to test for COVID and we have to give vaccines for COVID and we have to treat people who are, have COVID with the same amount of bodies. So whether you're in the health department or the front lines or public safety or whatever, you're going to feel like you're overworked. And if you've got a good supervisor who will come in and say, listen, I'm here with you. I'm supporting you. I'm going to work with you as much as I can. We're going to get through this together. Hang in there. It's not for a very long time. I'm doing everything I can to backfill spots. If that's the manager point of view, most of your employees are going to be good. Most people have enough common sense to know that this isn't going to last forever. It's tough times right now. The problem comes in when the manager tells the employer, the boss tells the employees, you need to work. You need to work, work while they're working nine to five, <laughs> while they're taking long lunches. Um, and I also want to remind us all to keep this in perspective. Keep this in perspective. Again, as we as we look over at uh, th these are just a couple articles that, that came out recently from uh, from overseas. Japan's thinking about going to a four day work week because you all know the Japanese concept of uh, Kiroshi, which is death by overworking. And so, you know, Japanese employees are famous for long hours at their desks and all these kinds of stuff. And so they're talking about going to a four hour, four hour work week, which I find interesting. China is the same way. They just had um, a death of an employee over there that just happened this week. And they're working at a, at a company called Pinduo Duo, which I think is, is some type of um, a, um, um, online sales organization. And they, here's a concept you may have never heard before living in America, but it's very prevalent over there. It's called the 996, the 996. It's a whole culture, which means you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. The amount of stress and lack of time. I mean, imagine, and you get home at nine and everything's closed. So on your off day, there's no rest. You've got to do your laundry and take care of your kids and have fun with them and go to the grocery store. And, do, and so you're constantly being stressed out. In fact, some people say that they work longer than this 996 and that she possibly died from overwork. So 
I'm not saying that to minimize what we do. I mean, we can be overworked as well, but please always keep it in perspective. <laughs> at least we're not, at least we're not doing that, that 996 kind of thing. So as a supervisor, talk with each employee, get to know them, see what they need. How can they be, um, be looked at every day as an individual to be aware if they're being overworked or not. All right. Leadership 101. This is my biggest one. Bad bosses don't back you up in disputes with citizens or customers. It's funny that Bamboo HR listed this one as one of their top mistakes of last year. And we've been preaching this for years. I mean, I learned this at Disney as a manager. We tried to change over. There is nothing worse that you can do as a supervisor or a boss than pull the rug out from under your employees, than make them look bad in front of a citizen and make them look bad in front of a customer. It is mortal sin number one, and your employees will talk about you behind your back for years, and if you don't have your employees' backs, they know it and forget about it. So, I mean, th this is as simple as, simple as uh, someone coming up to the Department of Revenue in Jefferson County and saying, hello, I've got, I'd like to, uh, you know, get the new tag for my car. And the person says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, your signatures don't match. In fact, you crossed it out here. So I need you to take this back to the dealership, get it redone and bring it back. Oh, they start throwing a fit, all this kind of stuff, because that's the rule. That's the regulation. That's the policy. They demand to see the manager. The manager comes out. They're on a hurry, on a break. The person's yelling, make, okay, this one time we'll make an exception. This one time, it's okay. Let them, and I, I know it doesn't match, but just, you know, go ahead and do it. There's so much danger in that. <laughs> There's so much danger in that because then the employee goes, why am I here? Why, why do we have these processes? What am I trying? You know, so if you are a boss or a supervisor, two ways to do this. Number one, you back up the employee. You back up the employee. You say, that's the rule. That's the policy. They're 100% correct. All right. It may leave you with an angry customer who has to come back, but at least you followed your rules and regulations and policies and you gained you gained a partner in your employees who go, thank you for having my back. Number two, there are times when you can make the exception as the boss. There are times where you are going to look at this and go, this doesn't fit the letter of the law. We can let this one slide. But the key is you don't tell the customer that. You pull the employee back and you say, listen, I'm going to have to go out and allow this. And here's why. So do you want to go out there and tell them that it's okay now? Um, and again, you, you, you explain to them the why behind the exception and let them go out and own it. The other way you could do it is you could go out and say, sir, you know, Kim is right. This is not filled out correctly. However, let me tell you what, what's, what's the reason we're accepting this is. And, you know, she was right in what she was doing. So again, somehow, as long as you're supporting the employee and you're doing, those are little things that you have to learn as you go, but I'm telling you, very good. Um, Josephine says this would undermine empowerment. Sure. We went back to number two, Josephine, which is empower your employees. Let them do what they can. That builds trust. And so you also, again, see, here's our problem in local government, Josephine, is we live in a rule or in a world of rules, regulations, policies, procedures, forms that are very cut and dry legally. And then we tell our employees, but do whatever it takes to make the customer happy but do what you can to take care of the customer. So then you give them that gray area to bend the rules. And then when they do or don't, you get called in. There's so many struggles that come with that. So yeah, this is hard. Balancing all of these trust, empowerment, respect, it's a big deal. So very, very good point. Right, let's do one more because again, we're about 12, 15. I want to make sure I give you at least time to go out and get a nice walk during your lunch break or whatever you might eat today. Um, bad bosses don't provide proper direction on assignments or roles. You know, this is, this again, is just a simple thing. Um, there's a fine line between micromanagement and making sure that um, you give the employees some space. So for example, and again, I'll use our training team as an example. Um, I want them to provide training classes, you know, with certain parameters, but I won't just stand back and just say, do this or do that or make this. And I, of course, I want to do it myself first and show them that, you know, I'm part of this too. So I want to give exact 
directions and expectations and steps and all these things, because a lot of employees want that. Then you're going to stand back and say, you can, you know, maneuver that however you want. But we find so many employees who get hired and just get told, here you go. Welcome to accounting. Figure it out. Well, how do you want this done? Just get it done. And then when they don't do it the way you want it or somebody else wants it, or they don't know what the landmine is, they're not supposed to step on, or they're not supposed to call. Don't call this person to ask. Is there, well, I didn't know I couldn't do all these things because you're not giving them any direction. You're not giving them any direction. You stand back and go, just get it done. And then you jump in and correct when they, that's, that, that's wrong. So whether it's, whether it's OGs, operating guidelines, um, you know, checklists, um, things like that, help your employees know. And this is interesting. This seems to be a bigger issue in small businesses than in large businesses. What that means is for um, organizations that only have between 25 and 49, those people who work there were more, more upset that they weren't getting direction. And they say, you can see again, 54% for 50 to 250. As the, as the organization gets bigger, as you get over 250 employees or up to 1,000 employees, some people just either say, I'll figure it out on my own, or maybe they say, I'll get lost in the shuffle. No one's going to notice me anyways if I mess this up or whatever. But again, I'm thinking about our, our small agencies, like maybe a Pleasant Grove or a Midfield or a Fairfield or a small department or things like that, where they got very small people. Those people need to know exactly what to do because number one, if they do it wrong, everyone's going to hear about it, you know, and know that don't call that person. They don't know what they're doing and there's nowhere to hide. So it, it's interesting that if you live in, in a small company, a small agency, a small jurisdiction, there's higher desire for those expectations than there is perhaps in a larger agency. As a supervisor, ask each employee, what do you need? What direction do you need? How can I help you get there? So, so that's it, y'all. And there's five more we're not even going to cover today. Uh, Natasha says balance is key. Yeah, you have to balance. You have to balance the trust and the micromanagement and all these things going together. So again, bad bosses, they take credit for other people's work. They don't trust or empower their team. They overwork their team and don't give them a reason why. They don't back them up when they're, you know, dealing with a customer or a citizen. And they also don't give them direction. Okay, if you can work on those things as a boss supervisor, if you have a leader or a supervisor, point them to this on Facebook and, hey, take a look at this. This isn't you, <laughs> but you may want to look at this a little bit anyways, and we'll also post it on our, on our website as well. All right, real quick, marketing, if I may, let me go and take myself off the screen for a second. We've got a bunch of great things happening this month in February. You see these lunchtime learning blasts? They're going to be kind of like this, 15, 20 minutes long. Friday, I think Michael Glaze is going to lead one on Friday about your thought patterns and how you control the way you think, and that controls that all the good things that you do. So that's going to be be exciting. We've got things about uh, appreciation and influence and, and micromanagement and all kinds of things. You'll see these dates here, you know, 12 to 1230. Then also this trainer talk thing you see on the right, it's kind of neat. That's going to be more interactive where, where we're going to have three trainers on the screen and we're going to be having like a, like a 45 minute dialogue, what each of us think about these leadership topics. So the 10th, we're doing personal professional goals. And the 24th, we're doing mistakes to avoid as a manager. So we're going to have a real nice open diet. It'll be fun. It'll be engaging. You can, you can take part, again, by uh, uh, um, sharing comments and notes and all that. And this Friday is our, our spark shop for February. Woo, do we need financial wellness right now? Um, we're happy to partner with AmFirst Credit Union, and we got a spark shop. You have to register for that one. So go to meritmatters.org if you're a merit system employee and register uh, for that one, most definitely. But anyhow, um, this has been fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it. Tell your friends, forward the link, tell them about these things in this calendar. Call us at the training department if you have any issues at all with uh, accessing these. But again, here's the key, go out there and don't be a bad boss. Cynthia, thank you for watching today as well. We appreciate you. Y'all have a great, great Tuesday. We'll talk to you soon.